strategist, I'm Will. Well, today we have a treat for you. We have a very common musket that a lot of people don't know very much about. I've traveled to Illinois and I'm in the one of the two offices of Agents Campbell and Pelican Military Goods. Jason Krause is with me. Jason and his brother Mark go ahead and provide people with collectibles, military weapons. Which one are we talking about today? We're talking about the Model 1854 Austrian Lorenz rifle. Tell me about this weapon. So as I was telling you earlier, this is the second most imported weapon during the war. Approximately 230,000 are brought in by the federal government in 1861-62. And approximately 100,000 were brought in by the Confederate government in 63-64. So approximately 330,000 between the two sides are brought in. Uh, different points in the war, and they're very widespread. You see them in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, in all theaters, really. Great. Well, I mean, my home passion, my first study for the Civil War has been the 3rd and 5th Michigan Infantry. They both start with Lorenz's. Beforehand, you told me that there are two denoting features about the Lorenz between different models of Lorenz. Tell me what we're looking for. Yep. Really, the, the designation between the Type 1 and Type 2 is reflected on the site. Here you have a high block sight, up above here you have a leaf sight. And this one's graduated up to uh, 900 paces with the Austrian system. Talk to me about some of the distinguishing features of the Lorenz. Absolutely. If you notice the ramrod, it has a brass tipped piece on it, which is very unique to that Austrian rifle. Also, if you notice the year in the lock plate, it omits the letter 1 for the year it was built. So a firearm built in 1861 would only read 861. Also, an arms designated for the Austrian government, you'll see that it is marked with a double eagle. On the back side of the gun, on the buttstock, you'll see that there is a cheek rest on some examples. In other examples, it is omitted. We've seen examples of a cheek rest on the Type 1 and Type 2, but it's not a guarantee yet to be there for all arms. And do we think the weapons were shipped with the cheek rest and removed here, or was that done back in Austria? Excellent question. The Austrian government was using cheek rest on ones and type twos, but later in the war when they were supplying the Confederate government, the government was requesting that the cheek rest be omitted to save time in production. So we don't think that that cheek rest was ever sanded off or planed off in the United States. Correct. It would have been something that was either left on or completely omitted from the production of the weapon later in the war. Well, the Austrians send their weapons over, but it comes in their caliber of ammunition. Talk to me about caliber of ammunition and how we handle it here in the United States. You know, it starts off in the metric system of 13.9 millimeters for the Austrians, which is equivalent to point. 547 in the English system. But when they bring these over, they bring them in 54, 55, 56, 57, 57, 7, 58, even 59 caliber. So it produces a huge headache for the federal government, even Confederate government, which ultimately is why they have to bore out some of them, the 58 caliber, to make it standard with the Springfield musket. Well, you were telling me beforehand there's a great, well-known story that has to do with getting rid of Lorenzes. Right. The second Wisconsin started off with Lorenzes. However, after the Gettysburg campaign, they are given or acquire more modern 58 caliber rifles and muskets. So that I'm sure it produced a headache for that ordnance sergeant trying to find ammunition for the Lorenzes. And of course, when they switch out, then you're with the rest of your corps and everybody's Bingo. 58 caliber. Absolutely. Great. Well, anybody who is around military weapons knows that the firearm is not the only part of the equation. In the Civil War, the bayonets, every bit is important. Talk to me about that. Absolutely. What sets the Lorenz completely different, unlike the traditional Springfield or Enfield rifle muskets is the fact that it's got a cruciform blade. It's a four-sided blade which is so unique to the Austrian system. It also has a diagonal opening for the front side as well which is different than what the English or the Americans were using at the time. You also see different scabbards and this scabbard itself that's an Austrian scabbard. It's a wooden shaft covered in leather which is contrary to what the U.S. government, which is producing leather scabbards. And you see right here and right here examples of two rivet scabbards specifically made for Lorenzes. 
they look very close to what is meant for a, a, a Springfield uh, bayonet, but if you look at the opening, it's an oval face. And that's how you're able to tell the difference between a Lorenz scabbard made by the federal government versus one that's made for their own firearms. Fantastic. Well, what appendages were given to care for these weapons? Sure. You see um, below here, we've got two different jags and a worm attached, as well as a wrench. And those jags are meant to be secured to the end of the ramrod and then screwed on. And that's how they're going to end up using cleaning patches or whatever they have to clean the barrels. You also see the wrench there, which has a screwdriver piece on one side as well as an opening for the cone. Great, so looking at this table, we have the firearm, we have the bayonet, we have a way to maintain the weapon and a way to clean the Correct. weapon. Correct. Fantastic. Well, thank you for hosting us here and for sharing the second most imported weapon of the Civil War. Thank you for spending your time with Civil War Digital Digest and with Agents Campbell and Pelican. We've had a great time bringing in this episode to you. We want to say thank you to our patrons. They make a lot more of this possible by underwriting some of the expense. We hope you'll think about it. There's a link down below. Take a look. Join the patrons. We call them the CWDD Coffee Grinders. We'll see you in a couple of